My next guest on the program is Finbar Fury. Now, he plays the iconic venue, the London Chapel, Islington, on Thursday, the 15th of November, as part of the London Folk and Roots Festival. Now, Finbar released the album Don't Stop This Now earlier on in the year and toured in the spring showcasing the material. Now, RTE describes it as Don't Stop This Now as an album we've all been waiting for from Finbar, a man at peace with himself and his music. For details of the concert, visit uh, www.unionchapel.org. See our website, also irishradio.org. Finbar, it's great to speak to you once again. Good afternoon. Lovely to hear your voice again, Jerry. Nice to hear you. Same as that. The last time I think Finbar was, uh, it was way over 25 years ago. I know. I was just thinking about it. That was a long time ago. Our hair was long in them days and we were still following, you know, following the path, the paths of peace and joy and luxury eventually got us in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> The Fibber, you, your career has been well documented from touring with, you, with your brother Eddie, uh, together with the, the Clancy Brothers and as a duo before teaming up with brothers Paul and George and Davy Arthur, and then going solo. However, I, be, I believe your earliest influences are now in forming your creative output. Now, your mother Nora, an accordion and banjo player, inspired you, and uh, your father uh, Ted was a fiddler who uh, yeah. played with the famous O'Donnell in the famous O'Donoghue's Bar in Dublin. One of the starters of it, done it was, you know, back in 1957. It was a sort of, um, very sort of polite little pub where you went with your girlfriend this afternoon. Uh, a fellow called John Malloy, the actor, very famous actor here in Ireland, he used to sort of uh, have his lunch at break in the pub and then he'd go in there in the evening for a few drinks and he decided to get a bit of music in. So he brought my father in and myself and Ronnie Drew, I remember, way, way back in Kieran Bourke, you know, and that we were the first, I'd say, to sit down in there and play a bit of music. But it became a very famous pub, a folk pub afterwards, you know, where the Dubliners formed. And, you know, Eddie and I left Ireland in 1967. Um, Joe Heaney, the Chanel singer down in the west of Ireland, his brother wasn't well, and uh, Joe had come in from Glasgow. He was living in Scotland at the time and had a 12-day tour to do in Scotland. So he asked me would I do the tour. So I asked Eddie, would he come with me? And Eddie was actually, we were a rock band at the time called the Spartans. And they'd played the Cavern in Liverpool. They were starting to take off now, you know. So Eddie said, ah, I'll go with you. So he traded his electric guitar for an acoustic and an acoustic 12 string, I remember. And we took off for Scotland and we went for 12 days to Scotland to do this tour. And we didn't come home for three years. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> we, we met up with, with people like Jerry Rafferty, Billy Connolly, the Corries, of course, Paddy Bell. We met all of these amazing people, Hamish Imlock, Alex Campbell. Um, uh, there was a rake of others, you know, um, the McCallmans. You know, it was, a, it was a rake of young people all growing up together, you know. Um, in among that selection would have been, as well as... Um, Tyrannosaurus Rex, Mark Boland would have been uh, coming through doing the, the theatres then as Tyrannosaurus Rex, you know. And they were sort of very uh, hippie band, if you like, in them days. <coughs> and uh, we all sort of used to meet up in Edinburgh and the festival was terrific, you know, because you got a, like a couple of months of where people would be coming in and out of town. So we actually made our base in Edinburgh and hooked up with Billy Connolly and Jerry Rafferty and Tom Harvey and other great musicians and just stay there and, and the music what we had you know what we were playing at the time uh, was sort of you know the critics in Ireland especially the trad uh, critics were having a go because Eddie and I wanted to push the music a bit more forward and we were writing songs you know as well right and um, you know I remember uh, just uh, to finish it off um, uh, coming home uh, in 19 well what was it Two years later, we came back for Christmas, Eddie and I, and then the Clancy Brothers got in touch with us in 1968. So we went to America with them until 1970, and uh, we had a great time with the uh, uh, Clancy's in America. It was a wonderful experience, you know, sharing the stage with the lads for three years, you know, living out of the same suitcase with them and watching them work on stage. They were great ambassadors for Irish music. And uh, <clears throat> when we came home, Jerry and Billy met up with us in Edinburgh, and they were breaking up themselves. So Jerry gave us an album, Would Her Father Didn't Like Me Anyway, Eddie and I. So we recorded it in London with, um, 
or the bass player. Oh, I can't remember his name now. I think it was in a minute. But uh, the three of us went in and just did one take of it for Barry Murray. And John Peel made it single of the year at the end of the year. So Eddie and I sort of took off again, if you like, in Britain, playing again. But mostly he went into the universities now and started doing bigger work, you know. And then we moved to Germany for a while and uh, eventually formed a band in 1976 with the brothers and became the Furies and there we are. And I was with the band then for, well, from that week up to 1996, 20 years. So it was an amazing time, you know. Indeed it was. Is, is there any truth to the story that as a child at Puck Fair in Kilorglan, you, you were sent to buy butter, which was you bought a tin whistle instead and picked up uh, pocket money busking? <laughs> Myself and Eddie wanted to go busking. We were only babies, you know. I think I was about five, uh, five or six. And in them days, you had a thing called country butter, which was salty butter, you know. You could get it in the, any sort of shop, you know. Yes. And uh, they always had a block of it on the table. They cut it and weigh it and put it in a sort of a piece of paper for it. And my mother sent me down any of this butter, and I was looking at it, this tin whistle in the window of the same shop. <laughs> it was a Clark's whistle, I always remember. I kept looking at the whistle and it was the same price as the butter. So I bought the whistle. I mean, I would have spent the day looking for me. He found me anyway, so I, I was trying to play the whistle and he taught me to play it at Home Sweet Home, which was, that was my own first tune on it. And um, then I decided I was going busking with my brother Eddie. So I remember he said to me, if we get lost, find the puck. You know, that was the goat where you walked <laughs> around. And them days, the goat was only up about four or six, five or six feet off the ground, you know, you could lift the kids up and they could pet the goat and things like that, but they had to move it because, you know, messers in the town at night, you know, they were, so the goat has moved up now, you know, you can't actually, you can see him, but you can't climb near him. In them days, you could climb up and actually pet him. Right. And I remember just standing beside the goat and eventually I climbed up and sat beside the goat until my auntie found me and brought me home anyway, with me a few bob. That was the story. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! So I slept beside a golden poke fair. Poke fair. <laughs> oh, th- things have kind of come full circle. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. yeah, you collaborated <laughs> with your with your daughter. Uh, I believe, uh, Fibber, you collaborated with your daughter on you seeing the taxis waiting, which is on the DVD for uh, "Don't Stop This Now." And uh, you're working with your son Martin on the soundtrack for a movie. Yeah, my son Martin. Well, I've asked him to help me out with this uh, film called Quarter, which has been put together by. Um, it was um, a poet called Robertson Jeffers. It's just starting to be put together at the moment. So Martin is a very good songwriter. He's also a, he's a terrific musician, you know, way ahead of me. You know, that I'll be only following his posse. But he's amazing, sort of. He's got an amazing array of instruments as well that he plays. But, um, you know, so I think, the st- you know, the music he's writing and where he is at the moment with the music, he's perfect for you know, for some of the parts in the film to help me out with some of the, the parts. So we, we'll get together on that. That'll be good, you know, to work with him. He's yeah. in America at the moment on tour. Right. So, now, um, now, you duet uh, Finbar uh, uh, last year with Christy Dignam on the, in the Greenfields of France on the, the Late Late Show, yeah. attracted a huge number of YouTube hits. Uh, you also wowed audiences when you sang with Imelda May on the Late Late Show uh, uh, from uh, London. Uh, any plans for an album of duets? Just, that just happens, you know, with Chrissy that night, it was a night sort of, we were sort of honouring the music, and Chrissy arrived in, you know, himself and Catherine and his missus and, and Billy, we had a great time actually afterwards having a chat, but he just wanted to sing the Greenfields of France, and we just did it, you know, I was actually um, uh, singing um, the John R. Uh, Jim Reeves song, with your sweet lips a little closer to the phone, with uh, Sharon Shannon that night. And I remember Shannon was dressed up in her bubbly dress and she looked absolutely brilliant. And we'd rehearsed it that day and it was perfect, you know. So when I'd finish with Christy, if you watch, when I finish the song with Christy, I run straight across to Sharon and we go straight into the song because we're ready to go. So it was, it was, couldn't take me eyes off Christy, you know, watching every movie he was making. Man, it's such a beautiful song. But when he sang, when he starts singing it, it was so beautiful, you know, I just got carried away. So much so I, you know, I nearly didn't make the song with Sharon. 
you know, but it was brilliant. It was. Now, the the UU Chapel is a superb venue, a a working church and a drop-in centre for the homeless with a a great atmosphere and acoustics. Uh, What can can people expect from your concert on the 15th of November? I'm looking forward forward to it, first of all, because I've played in Kilkenny um, Cathedral a couple of times and Clare Morris Cathedral. And um, I'm back in Kilkenny Cathedral again just uh, no, uh, in November, actually. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. That was a beautiful night of music. And they have the local musicians, you know, that go on, the young kids go on and play some music. And it becomes a really great concert at the end, you know, when everybody gets involved with the singing. And it's very loose and very lovely. And I'm really looking forward to it. Really, really am. Yeah. Right. You know, we have uh, some lovely music that, like, I I don't like really doing concerts, if you like, you know. I love doing sessions on stage. I love just going for it. You know, the band I have with me are amazing because, you know, they don't know what key half the time I'm going to go into, you know. So (laughs) if I start, then they'll follow me and they know exactly then where I'm going to go. And there's a great, you know, and they loved it. They actually love it. And they play with other bands as well as, you know, being on the road with myself. And I love their company because it doesn't matter where where I go, they'll find me, you know. Uh, the music, I think, is so lovely when it's done that way rather than rehearse to death until there's nothing left, only just the technical sort of run on stage, you know. Yes. But I think when you're doing it straight off the cuff like that, you know, we have a run during the, during the day where we actually rehearse songs that we're not going to sing on stage. Right. You know, so we can just put stuff together. And if we need to, here's a song then, and words of a new song, we'll go through that. Or well, once we get it in there, you know, it could be any song we'll start off with, you know. It's just, you know, I usually use the boatman. It's just to loosen my fingers, you know, the lonesome boatman on the flute. and loosens the fingers, my fingers up, you know. And then I get into the banjo or the guitar, and then... It's that it just it's knees up from there on, you know, every man for himself. Mighty. Now, reflecting on the past... Every te- woman for herself. Yeah. <laughs> reflecting, uh, Finbar, on the past, Terry Wogan and John Peel put you on the on the map. Off uh, Terry Wogan, you acknowledged that he had a, a big influence on breaking the Furies in the UK. You're quoted as saying, if ever we had a single, uh, he'd play it, and John Peel awarded you Single of the Year in 1972. John uh, awarded Eddie and I singing over the Beatles, which was great, you know, and we loved the Beatles, Eddie, and I always loved our music, and I never met, uh, I met George Harrison through Eddie Jordan uh, one time, Eddie invited me to a party to, as a, you know, to play a bit of music for him, and uh, George Harrison had to be, happened to be there, so I got to meet him a couple of times, you know, which was nice, but um, yeah, well, I remember it was terrific, Eddie and I were sitting under a bridge in London, a railway bridge. I always remember it parked in this old Daimler car. The thing was falling asunder. With two sleeping bags in the back. And we had our instruments in the boot. And we were doing, waiting on a folk club to open that night because we were playing in And the, the pubs didn't open until seven. And um, we were waiting on the, the pub to open so we could get something to eat and tune up. No microphones in them days. And... Um, yeah, we were listening to the radio and we were just listening to John Peel, you know, and I heard it that night, you know, when we were actually on stage that he'd made it single of the year. And we went, wow, that's brilliant. <laughs> we were blown away, myself and Eddie. So I remember uh, we drove all the way back to Daventry that night. That's where we were living at the time. So we drove through the night to Daventry, you know, and we were just saying, well, that's kept... You know, there was no high fives in them days. We just said nothing to each other. <laughs> <laughs> uh, inc- incredible. Now, the Union Chapel... It was great. It was, very, it was really exciting, Joe. You know, it's really, really exciting. I mean, two kids from Bandy Farmer, you know, on a 12-string guitar and a set of them pipes. I just took the Beatles out and over one single of the year. That was amazing. You know? <laughs> amazing. Now, the, U- the, the, the Union Chapel listening to the authority, 15th of November is the venue at which uh, you can see the remarkable uh, Finbar Fury live. You can visit unionchapel.org.uk or our website, irishradio.org. Finbar, listen, it's been great to speak to you once again. Enjoy your night in Union Chapel. Friends of our show will be out in force to see you, including Sarah Finucane, who will be celebrating her birthday that night. A very happy birthday to you, uh, Sarah. Happy birthday to Sarah. Indeed, and uh, from all here at Irish Radio, Fimber, listen, it's, uh, it's been lovely to speak to you once again after uh, over 25 years. You're still going strong and a, a pleasure to talk to you again. Sure, sneak along that night and have a glass of wine afterwards, so we'll have a, we'll have a chin wag. Exactly, Fimber, thanks a million. Harry, take care, God bless you, take care. Thank you for everything.
Bye-bye.